Good morning and welcome. It's a good thing. It's a good thing I don't take these things personally. There are times where they, I love to hear the conversations, but some of you make eye contact with me after I've said good morning like four times, and you just keep talking, and I'm like. Uh, do you not want me to talk? Okay. Uh, well, good morning and welcome to Redemption Hill. Uh, my name is Tim. I am one of the pastors here. Uh, it is uh, truly a joy to be able to gather together uh, with you to hear about uh, missions, to, to hear about what God is doing throughout the world, to, to pray together, to sing together, uh, to hear God's word together, just to be together. Um, it, is, it is truly a joy. So thank you for joining us this morning. Um, uh, The last two days I've been uh, chaperoning, helping to chaperone uh, nine fifth and sixth grade boys at the retreat. So there's that. Um, (laughs) I can can confirm for you in case you were wondering, uh, fifth and sixth graders, uh, at least boys, need no sleep and no food. Um, 47 year olds need both of those. And so um, we, we, uh, they're doing a wonderful job down there at the retreat. Uh, Kim Johnson, Emily Welch have set that retreat up. They did an amazing job. Um, Pastor Raymond is there uh, teaching and sharing. There are other leaders that are leading discussions and, and, and sharing as well. And, and, uh, and, and they're just doing an amazing job. And, and the kids that are there are, are fantastic as well. And so um, I truly believe that God is doing uh, some wonderful things uh, there. And so um, I spent Friday and Saturday with them. Uh, usually when I preach, uh, Friday and Saturday are when I'm um, kind of running through the sermon, working through to, to make sure it's, it's, it's finished. Um, and so I, I had to make sure that it was finished uh, before that uh, this, this week. And so on Thursday night... I came over here uh, to the church building to finish my sermon, and before uh, I left that night, my seven-year-old daughter told her I had to leave, and she said, no, Daddy, don't leave. It was very sweet. Um, And then she remembered that I was preaching, and she said, oh, that's right. You have to get ready for your concert. Um, (laughs) The very thing that I have longed to to hear for over 40 years finally came, came through. And so I looked at her, and I said, that is exactly right, Clementine. I have to get ready for my concert. So you might be getting more than you anticipated as you came in this morning. Uh, Last week, uh, we started our uh, new series going through the gospel of Luke. Uh, Pastor Shelby led us uh, through really the first three chapters of Luke at the start of Luke uh, from from chapter one and and through the baptism of Jesus in chapter three, verses 21 and 22, where the, the... Holy Spirit descends and God the Father speaks and proclaims from, from heaven that this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Uh, such a magnificent and, and humbling scene, such a tr- tremendous scene that many of us are familiar with. And next week we're going to be looking at, at another scene that is, that is often uh, well known um, and, and is magnificent in its, in its own right. Uh, Jesus is going out into the wilderness. He is going out into to the wilderness for 40 days, eating nothing, um, and he will be tempted by the devil. Uh, an incredible part of, of the life of Christ that is filled with, with drama and great truths about who, who Jesus is. And so that leaves us with what is this week. Um, we are bookended by two uh, amazing stories that many people know, and right in between of them, uh, in between them is is what is known as the genealogy of Jesus, uh, which is only made interesting by the words of Jesus. Um, otherwise, we just have a 45-minute genealogy lesson in front of us, um, and, and that doesn't sound too great. But as we often say, all of God's word is is inspired by the Holy Spirit, and these words are profitable for us as the hearer, profitable for us as, as we read these things, as, as the hearers of God's words, which means that God spoke these words through human authors, and so the Almighty God is speaking to us today. And, and while these verses are often uh, skipped over or read through very quickly um, when you're reading through the Bible, um, this wasn't just put here to, to just make the Bible longer, to make Luke's gospel longer. There's a very specific purpose. And so there is much for us to learn uh, from these 16 verses at the end of Luke chapter 3. Um, 
uh, 16 verses that, that includes 77 names, including Jesus' name. And so today we are in Luke chapter 3, verses 23 through 38. Uh, if, if you've got the Pew Bible in front of you, hopefully there's a few Bibles upstairs as well. Um, it's on page 859 of, of those Bibles. So again, this is Luke chapter 3, verses 23 through 20, 38. Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son as was supposed of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Matthias the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Jana, the son of Joseph, the son of Mattathai, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of Esli, the son of Nagai, the son of Math, the son of Mathatias, the son of Semei, the son of Josek, the son of Joda, the son of Jonas, the son of Resa, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the son of Neri, the son of Melchi, the son of Adam, the son of Kosan, the son of Almadam, the son of Ur, the son of Joshua, the son of Eliezer, the son of Joram, the son of Mathat, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonah, the son of Eliakim, the son of Melia, the son of Menna, the son of Mathatha the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Selah, the son of Nashon, the, so, the son of Amadab, the son of Amon, the son of Arai, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Sereg, the son of Ru, the son of Peleg, the son of Eber, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of Arafat, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalael, the son of Canaan, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, uh, we thank you. Uh, we thank you for every word that you've placed in, in your word uh, to give to us. Uh, we thank you uh, that you have a, a purpose and a meaning uh, then when it was written and for us today. Um, so, Father, I pray that you would open our eyes and our hearts. Um, open our ears to hear your word. Um, I pray that you would um, use... Uh, these 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 names and and the story uh, that they that they have and 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 the the truth that that in 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 you we find life um, in in your in your son we we find new life and and father I pray that you would um, take that to our hearts that you would transform our hearts today um, use this in a, in a great way we ask these things in Jesus name Amen. Uh, so uh, we want to set the scene uh, clearly uh, for us today. I, I want you to see uh, a few things that will help us as we get to the real heart of why this matters to, to us today. What, what does this actually mean to us today? So there's a few things to set before that. Um, Luke places his genealogy uh, here in Luke chapter 3 right in the middle of t telling his narrative of the life of Jesus. He doesn't have to put the genealogy here. There's another genealogy of Jesus. It's in the Gospel of Matthew. And that Gospel starts the book of Matthew. Um, for, from verse 1 of chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1 verse 4 says, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah. Um, and, and that seems to make sense. So you could just start the whole book with that. But Luke doesn't start there. He starts right after we've had the baptism of Jesus and then he talks about Jesus beginning his ministry at the age of, of 30. Uh, and so there's a number of things going on here. The, 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 the heavens have just opened up. The Holy Spirit has come down like a bird. The voice of God has, has boomed out. Um, the, the, the announcement of Jesus' ministry is, is starting at 30 years old. Um, and then as we talked about right after this, we're going to see Jesus beginning his earthly ministry. 
And he will start that time by going out in a desert for 40 days, and Satan will meet him in the desert to tempt Jesus away from his purpose, to tempt Jesus away from, from what God had, had, had planned for him. Um, and so the ordering of this has to mean something. There has to be a reason. Uh, if you're telling a story and it's building up and it's getting good, most people wouldn't think, let me stop and list off 75 generations of genealogy. Um, so clearly there has to be a purpose to it. Uh, Luke is trying to show us something here early on. Um, he, is, he is slowing down for a moment uh, to help us focus our attention. He wants to help us see and focus in our eyes on Jesus. The truths contained in this genealogy are especially important as Jesus is about to begin his earthly ministry. This genealogy helps to, to, to validate him to the hearer, uh, to, to, to prove he is who he says he is. And, and, and for us today, Luke is trying to help us see clearly who Jesus is, and, and specifically that Jesus is a very real person and that Jesus is in fact the true, beautiful, beloved Son of God. Um, first, he, he's helping us to see that Jesus is a real person. Um, uh, this, is, this is valuable and important. The, these genealogies, again, we pass by them so much, but the Bible is actually filled with genealogies. 14 books of the Bible contain a genealogy. Uh, the, the longest one is in the book of, of, of Chronicles, and it's nine chapters long. Um, and so for some reason, God has determined that genealogy is really important in the Bible. As I mentioned uh, earlier, there are two genealogies, this here in Luke and then in, in Matthew. And if you've read those before, or if you read them in the future, I, I want to, to help you work through them, to help you uh, either prepare or to think through what you've already read. Um, the truth is they are different. Um, they are, they, there's a number of differences between these two genealogies. Um, and as you just read, they're just names. So the differences are there. There's many different names in each of these, these things. And for some of us, um, and for, for some people, it has led them to believe that the Bible, in fact, um, is, is wrong or contains errors or, or, or just, just, you know, it, it misses the, the, the mark sometimes. Um, and and it, it makes sense. There, there's, a, there's a real sense in which a, a genealogy is, is simply a list of of basic facts. So if I have a list of names and you have a list of names and we say they're from the same family, um, but, but they aren't the same list, then it would seem that somebody has to be wrong. Um, now there are a number of theories on why Matthew and Luke are, are different on these genealogies, but I think, I think the, most, the, the most likely and, and the most common um, is simply that, G, that Matthew is giving us Joseph's genealogy and that Luke is giving us Mary's genealogy. Um, there, were, there were two parents. There was, there was Mary who gave birth to Jesus. There was Joseph who was the adopted earthly father of Jesus. Um, and so the, the, the likelihood is that we simply get to see both of their genealogies. Um, and the truth is, um, you can say, well, so, so Luke is, is the, the, the genealogy of, of Mary, but Joseph's name is listed. Um, but we know from historical sources that Mary did not have uh, male siblings. And so it was likely at that time, um, it was a normal part of life to, for, for the, the father of the, the, the daughter to, to, to adopt legally the, 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 the son-in-law. And so legally, in the way it would be portrayed, um, Joseph would have been the, the, the son. And the way that they did genealogies at that point, most of the time, that was the male that was, that was listed. And so this just points to the fact that, that we, that we have two different gene genealogies, but they point to the same thing. Uh, they lead us to the, to the same thing. Um, we can be certain that, that the Bible is not, in fact, full of errors. And that's an important thing for us to understand, because otherwise we will get bogged down in, in things like that. But this is, this is uh, proven true, and we can understand that, that, that there's no doubt in the truth of the Bible, um, because people at this time, Jewish people especially, kept very careful records. Um, who your parents were and who their parents were were foundational in business, commerce, owning property. Um, much of their, their, their system was built on things like genealogy, uh, which means that if either of these men writing uh, the, these, these gospels were in fact wrong, they, they just got it wrong, it would have been easily uh, disproven. They could have easily disproven it um, from 
from almost the start of the, the genealogy. They, they start to differ almost immediately. And so, it would have, in, in fact, it would have been very necessary to prove them wrong um, because of the way property and things like that passed on. And, and yet, these writings, these gospels, have been placed and used and accepted by the church since the very earliest moments of the church. Um, this was not a stumbling block to those in the early church. Um, no, the, these, these genealogies aren't full of errors. This genealogy here in Luke isn't, isn't just wrong. In fact, quite the opposite. Uh, these genealogies confirm for the reader the historical truthfulness of who Jesus was. Luke is giving us this genealogy of Christ in order to, to help us and to root us in the story of Jesus and, and to see that he is, he is rooted in concrete, true, historical realities. Um, he is listing concrete, historical figures that are identified in Jesus' family line. These were facts that could have been easily proven or disproven, and these facts point to the fact that Jesus was a real man with a real family tree full of other real men and women. He was not a myth. He was not a fairy tale. He, is, he, he was flesh and blood. He, is, he had a father and a grandfather and a great-grandfather and, and, and a great-grandmother and so on. And so, and so they point to the fact that Jesus was, is a real man. The other big difference between the genealogies in Matthew and Luke is that Matthew in his genealogy was primarily writing to, to, at that time to the Jews. And so that genealogy actually only goes back to Abraham, uh, who was the father of the Jews. It was important for those, those people reading Matthew to see that Jesus was directly related to Abraham for them to believe that this was the Messiah, to believe that the Messiah came from Abraham. But Luke is primarily written uh, to Gentiles. And so Luke goes all the way back to the beginning, all the way back to the beginning of, of human history to help them see that Jesus was the Savior of all, the Jews and the Gentiles. And so while genealogies might seem boring and, and, and maybe even unnecessary, for Jesus to be the Messiah and for us to believe that he was the, the, the Savior, the Messiah that had been promised, for us to see that, what was, was, it was invaluable to have this genealogy. It was necessary. Um, it was necessary for, for the people back then and is necessary for us today. And Luke tells us in the, in the very beginning of this gospel, when he's writing to Theophilus, he says in, in, in chapter 1, verse 4, I'm writing to you so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. I'm writing to you so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. This genealogy was adding to the certainty of who Jesus is. And so Luke makes it clear that Jesus was a real person, a real man, with a real family history. Luke also shows us that Jesus is the perfect son of God. He wants to leave absolutely no doubt that Jesus was a man, but not just a man, that he was in fact the beloved son of God. He was God himself. He was God the son. Um, this genealogy goes all the way back to God the father. It says in verse 38 of chapter 3, it says the son of Adam, the son of God. Now, showing that Jesus was, was the beloved Son of God is, is a clear and distinct point that, that Luke is really focusing in on and the way he tells his narratives, the way he tells the stories that, 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 that form Jesus' life. Um, God's voice had just announced from heaven that Jesus is his beloved Son at his baptism. Verse 22 of chapter 3, the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. And then soon Satan will attack the sonship of Jesus in the wilderness, immediately following this, this genealogy. And in that chapter, twice, in verses 3 and 9 of chapter 4, Satan says to Jesus, if you are truly the son of God, and then Satan would go on to tempt him. If you are truly the son of God, almost mocking him, you can feel the magnitude, I hope, of what is going on here. These stories have all the necessary and important figures that were present in the very beginning. At the beginning of creation, in the, in the book of Genesis, you had God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They were creating, they were forming. And then you had the enemy was there tempting the first created people, Adam and Eve, to sin. 
And here in Luke, we have God the Father, God the, the Holy Spirit, and, and God the Son. And Satan is here trying to tempt that Son, the beloved Son, the one who will bring about a new creation, the one who will reset all the things that, that, that went wrong in Adam, in the first man. Satan is here tempting Jesus, attacking him. Luke wants you to know that Jesus is the perfect son. Adam is described here in verse 38 as the son of God. God miraculously created Adam, but Adam failed. Adam sinned. And when he sinned, he brought sin into this world. And every human that was born into that first Adam was born a sinner. But Jesus, as the perfect son, as the beloved son, he would never fail. He would never sin. He lived his life perfectly. He was the perfect son that God looked at and proclaimed that he was pleased with. And it is Jesus that reverses, turns back all that Adam had done. Jesus is described often. Uh, we see these connections to Adam. Jesus is described as the last Adam and the second man. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. The first man, Adam, was a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. Jesus became the better Adam. Adam had brought sin into the world, but Jesus, as the beloved son that pleased the Father, was going to take that sin and pay the penalty for that sin. He was going to defeat the enemy that is sin. The first Adam was tempted in a garden and gave in to that temptation. Jesus, as the last Adam, is getting ready to be tempted in a desert, a wilderness by Satan, not once but three times, and he will not fail. He does not fail. He does not sin. He does not give in to that temptation. The first Adam turned away from the, the father in the garden of Eden, and the last Adam turned to the father in the garden of Gethsemane. The first Adam sinned by eating fruit that hung on a tree, and that last Adam saved us, saved us from our sin by being hung on a cross. The first Adam lost the tree of life, and the, this last Adam is, 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 is the tree of life that we now abide in. The first Adam was the head of, of the old creation. This last Adam makes all those who believe in him a new creation. The first Adam was meant to reign over all of creation, and this last Adam, Jesus, will reign over all creation forever and ever. Because Jesus was the perfect son, for those of us that trust in him, trust in that beloved son, God will say to you, you are my beloved son, you are my beloved daughter. So Jesus is a very real man, and Jesus is the son of God. He is the perfect son man and he is the perfect son of God. So what does this genealogy then mean for us today? Two things I hope that we see you can see clearly. First, that Jesus perfectly fulfills God's promises and plans. I get a lot of junk email. I know all it takes is is pressing the uns unsubscribe button at the bottom of the email, but for some reason I'd rather delete 18 emails a day uh, than pressing that button. And so I got a junk email uh, from a company that makes signs the other day um, that was entitled, I just got this letter from future Tim. Um, <laughs> and and if, if you know me, some of you know me, you know that I love science fiction. I'm a sci-fi nerd. I especially love time travel, parallel universes, all the weird things that people have created. Um, so most of the time, I would just immediately press the delete button and move on with my day. But for this one, I just pause and I'm like, what if I did send myself a letter? I don't want to just delete that. Uh, and, so, and so I opened it up, mistake number one, began to read a really long email, supposedly from my future self about how grateful I was that I bought these signs from this company <laughs> and how they were the best signs that I had ever purchased. And I just kept thinking, why would I write this to myself? <laughs> this doesn't sound like me at all. And then at the end of the email, I tell my past self to buy more of these signs. 
And then it is signed, Love Future Tim. And at that point, I knew something wasn't right. Uh, <laughs> up until then, I was still wondering. Uh, that should have been the end of it. But, but again, sci-fi brain. So, so for the next two days, I just kept thinking, what, what if I did write myself a letter from the future? <laughs> what would I say? And what would I do with that information? And my mind just starts to wonder about what it would be like to, to get a message about my future, about the future, and how much excitement or dread or anticipation it would bring. God has been telling his people messages about the future since the very beginning. He has been telling people what is coming in the future since the very beginning. He has sent messages about the coming Messiah since, since the book of Genesis. And with those messages about the future Savior came a sense of anticipation and excitement that had gone on through, through 75 generations of, of families waiting to see who the promised one would be. And so Luke's genealogy is a proclamation. It is, it is a proclaiming of the fulfillment of those promises and plans. That Jesus is the one that fulfills all, those, all that anticipation, all that excitement. God told the first man and woman that someone in their descendants, even after they sinned, someone of their descendants was going to make right the thing that went so wrong. Genesis 3.15, after Satan has deceived Eve into eating the fruit of the tree, God is speaking to Satan as the serpent and tells him, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The offspring of Adam and Eve was going to bruise or crush the head of the evil one. What this meant to, to Adam and Eve is that, is that one of their children or their grandchildren or their great-grandchildren was going to defeat and destroy the evil one. What anticipation. When they had children, when they had grandchildren, they had to wonder, is this, is this the one? Is, 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 it, is it finally here? God promises in the very beginning of the Bible that one of the descendants of Adam and Eve, even though they sinned and hid themselves from God, God shows them grace immediately and says, out of your offspring, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defeat Satan, defeat the enemy once and for all. How much anticipation would you have if someone told you that? You've been waiting your entire life, wondering which of, of your children or grandchildren was going to rise up and defeat Satan. They would tell this to their children and their children's children. And they would be filled with anticipation. God himself told us what is going to happen. And from this point on, anticipation begins to build in a mighty way with God's people. The anticipation that someone would be born and that that person would destroy and would crush the enemy. And it is at this point in Genesis 3 that things like genealogies become very important to all of us. If you are a part of this line, if you are a part of this family tree, then you are a part of the line that would bring the end, the, the, the defeat of every enemy, the defeat of the, the deceiver, the evil one. And as, we, as you move through the Old Testament, as you move through this list of names in Luke 3, God gets more specific and it just continues to build the anticipation. God tells Abraham, who is a part of this same genealogy in Genesis 22, 18, in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. God promises an elderly man and woman who had no children that their genealogy, their line, their family tree was going to bless all nations of the earth. Genesis chapter 49, verses 8 through 12, God promised Judah, who we see in verse 33, that, that the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. This prophecy was pointing to a coming king from the line of Judah, a king that would have the obedience of all the people, a king that would look similar to, to what Paul proclaims in, in Philippians, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And then to David, who is right here in this genealogy, God proclaims many times throughout the Old Testament 
that the Savior, the Messiah, would come from David's line, David's family. 2 Samuel, verses 12 through 13, it's just one of those times God is talking to, to David through the, through the prophet Nathan. And Nathan says to him, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. The line of David was going to bring about a kingdom reign forever. He was going to build a house, a people for, for the name of the Lord, for Jesus to be the Messiah, for Jesus to be Savior of all, he had to be the son of Adam in verse 38. He had to be the son of Abraham in verse 34. He had to be the son of Judah in verse 33. He had to be the son of David in verse 31. This is the anticipation that these people had lived with for their entire lives. When children were born, when, when birth announcements were sent out, people had to wonder, is this the one promised to David who will sit on the throne forever and ever? And yet, they waited generation after generation after generation. They waited and they wondered. Jesus was the one who would defeat every enemy. He would be the blessing to every nation on earth. He was the king who would sit on his throne forever. And this genealogy shows us that even if it seems like God is not moving quickly enough, even when it feels like we need him to fulfill his promises faster than he's doing, even when it feels like the plans aren't clear enough or, or the plans aren't happening fast enough, this, this genealogy shows us that they, all of these things are perfectly fulfilled in God perfectly fulfilled in Christ. All of God's promises are perfectly fulfilled in him. We can trust him. He will not fail. And, and, and we see that clearly. These people had waited again and again, years after years. Generations are passing away. And yet, here was Jesus, the fulfillment of all the promises and plans that they were so desperate to see. And so we see that this genealogy shows us that in, in Christ, all the plans, all the promises are perfectly fulfilled. And then this genealogy finally see, helps us see that our stories are made perfect in Jesus. Uh, when we research our family history, if you've ever done that, most of us are looking or trying to find our ancestors that did something important, something heroic in some way. Uh, there are actually uh, several TV shows that are entirely based on genealogy. Uh, it's called Who Do You Think You Are on NBC, Finding Your Roots on PBS. Uh, if you really like genealogy, I encourage you to watch them. Um, uh, it, it, they, they show most of the time celebrities, and then they take them through their, their genealogies. And, and the shows are interesting and told in a, in a very compelling way. And I've only seen a few of them. Um, but the, the most compelling part of, of these series is not when they talk about the great people in their family history. The most compelling part is when they finally tell the celebrity who the really, really awful person is in their family. Um, the music builds, uh, the, they, they take a perfectly timed commercial break, and then they come back and tell this movie star that their great-great-grandfather betrayed America. And, and that their great uncle was a Russian spy and your great grandmother tried to assassinate Lincoln. And, and then the, the, the camera slowly zooms in on their face and whether it is real or manufactured, just a sense of, of, of great overwhelmingness just overtakes them. And, and, and what you see in that moment is, is really a sense of, of shame and guilt that just washes over them. They are so ashamed to know that someone in their family just three, four, five generations ago did something awful. Many of us deal with the shame and guilt of our families. We are ashamed of things that they've said and done. Sometimes it's because of what our families have done to us. Others, we find out later in life that, that family members that we looked up to as, as children were more sinful than we ever imagined. And those things can haunt us. They can hang over our, our lives. They can make us feel 
like we personally have no hope of redemption. If this is the family that I've come from, then what hope do I have? We feel destined to become awful sinners like those before us in our genealogy have been because our family is full of awful sinners. The, the wonderful thing about the, the, the life and compassion of Jesus is that Jesus understands the way that feels. His family tree was filled with sinners. No matter what your earthly family tree looks like, you are not bound to become your father or your mother. You are not bound to become what the worst person in your history has, has done. You are not, not, not bound to, to end up exactly like them. You are not past redemption because your family tree feels too broken and, and, and sinful. When Jesus saves you, he takes you and he places you into a new family. You have a new genealogy. You have a new family line. God the Father is at the beginning of this and Jesus is at the end of it. What an incredible testimony here in Luke 3 that, to, to say that this is your family tree. God is the Father and Jesus is at the end. This family tree is not remarkable because of David or Judah or Noah or Abraham. It is remarkable because of God. It is remarkable because of Jesus. Jesus can redeem your history. Jesus can redeem your family's history. He can put you in a new family so that you know and can trust that, that, that those things aren't the things that, that you are bound by. You are now bound by the love of Christ and what he has done for you. Jesus can redeem your history and Jesus can redeem your personal story. This genealogy doesn't just point us to the sinfulness of our families, but it shows us that all of us are sinners in need of a savior. Luke's gospel records a long line of sinners. Adam was in paradise. He was in the, the Garden of Eden, as close to paradise as this earth has experienced. Adam was in paradise, and yet he brought sin into this world. Abraham committed adultery. He was a liar. He gave his wife away twice to protect himself just because he was a coward. Jacob was a cheater and a thief. Noah was a drunkard. David was an adulterer and a murderer. And those are just the sins that were big enough to put into the Bible. Those weren't the only sins that they committed. Their sin has been put on display for all of, of human history. If there were a museum of sin, which my wife reminds me is a bad idea for a museum, but if there, <laughs> if there was a museum of sin, then these men would consume that museum. They would have entire wings devoted to their sin. We look at this and sometimes see the heroes of the faith. But the truth is, apart from Christ, these aren't heroic tales. All 76 names listed in this genealogy after Jesus, all of them were sinners. All of their wives, all of their children, all of them were sinners. All of them did what was right in their own eyes. All of them chose themselves over God. They chose their own way over God's way. Adam was called the son of God. God himself brought him to life from nothing and called Adam his son. And yet because of his sin, he was separated from God and he needed a savior. 75 generations of sinners who desperately needed a savior. No matter what has happened in your past, no matter what you have done or thought, Jesus can save you. If these liars, murderers, adulterers, cowards can be saved, then anyone can be saved. No matter what your past looks like or your present feels like, no matter where you've been or what you've done, God can redeem and perfect your story, your history. Once you are in Christ, your story is, is, is now proclaiming how great Christ is. And so he has, he has perfected your story, even if you see it as flawed. There's a lot of brokenness in Jesus' family line. There's a lot of hurt, sin, and pain. There's a, there, there's, there's, but these are stories now of the grace of God. In these forgotten names from the past, God puts the focus on the amazing grace that he sends to sinful men and women. The fact that they find themselves 
recorded and mentioned in the family that includes God and Christ is what makes their stories great. It is the same thing that makes our stories great today. No matter what we've gone through, no matter what we've experienced, no matter what our family did, if you can say that God is my father and that I am a part of the family of Christ, then you have a story that is now made perfect in Jesus. You have been transformed from Adam into Christ. God formerly saw you and dealt, you, dealt with you only through Adam, but he now sees you and he deals with you through his beloved son, Jesus. You are in Christ forever. You are in Christ and cannot be taken away from that. The genealogy of Jesus shows a remarkable story full of fulfilled promises, perfected stories, and all of this is true because Jesus was the perfect son. The hero of this story is God. His grace shines through the darkness of human sin. It shines through the darkness of human history. His salvation breaks through the most flawed family trees. We are born in Adam, but we are born again in Christ. We have new life. We are a new creation. And when we trust in Christ, our names are added to a list. Our names are added to, to, a, to a book, the Lamb's Book of Life. In that Lamb's Book of Life, there is, there is a long list of names, much longer than the list that I read earlier. And it is not a list of boring names that we quickly glance over when we read through the Bible. It is a list of names of everyone that has received the grace of God and has believed in Jesus. It is a list of names of your family, your children, the men and women that you serve alongside, the men and women that you come together each week and worship alongside of. It is a list of names of the men and the women in, in the Bible that have trusted and you've read about, the men and, and women in your life that have poured into you and discipled you. It is a list of names of people that have shared the gospel with you. It is a list of names of people that you have shared the gospel with. It is a list of those who have truly been forgiven. A list of everyone who has been saved by the power of God, saved from our sins by Jesus. A list of everyone who has been called sons and daughters of God. A list of people who will all say that we have nothing to boast in other than Jesus. A list of people who will all join together at one time and sing the praises of Jesus forever and ever. I don't know that there's many things more exciting than the thought of hearing those names read out and knowing that every single story is a testimony to the greatness of Jesus. To borrow a phrase from an old hymn, what a day of rejoicing that will be. That is the beauty and glory of God. Let's pray together. Father, we, th we thank you and praise you that you know us, you care for us, you know our names, you have, for all of us that have, have tasted of your goodness, experienced your grace and trusted and put our faith in you, Father, you have written our names down and they will never be blotted out. Father, I, I, I thank you <laughs> for the amazing work that you do in, in our lives, the, the, the work of transformation from taking sinful people with sinful histories and making us your redeemed people, making us your family, your church. Father, I pray that you would remind us of the, the great grace that you have shown us, of the power that you have shown us, and that you would use that to transform our lives, that we would walk confidently knowing that we are part of your family, that in, 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 in Christ, that we will be seen as righteous, we will be seen as he is seen, beloved, and because of that, we will get to be with you forever and ever. I pray that that would move us today, tomorrow, that you would transform our lives to live to your glory, that would move us to share your beautiful gospel with those that don't know it, 
and that you would continue to do your amazing work of, of saving your people. Father, we, we thank you so much. We praise you and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.